Right, so if you want to find um, 1 Samuel 22, Ruth's going to come and read that for us. David at Adullam and Mizpah. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in great distress or in debt or discontented to gather round him, he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. Now Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered, and Saul was seated, spear in hand, under the tamarisk tree on the hill at Gebeah, with all his officials standing at his side. He said to them, Listen, men of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is that why you have all conspired against me? No one tells me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie in wait for me as he does today. But Doeg the Edomite who was standing with Saul's officials, said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Ahimelech, son of Ahitub at Nob. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Then the king sent for the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, and all the men of his family who were the priests at Nob. And they all came to the king. Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. Yes, my lord, he answered. Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse? giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does today. Ahimelech answered the king, Who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard and highly respected in your household? Was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. But the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and your whole family. And the king ordered the guards at his side, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because they too have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, yet they did not tell me. But the king's officials were unwilling to raise a hand to strike the priests of the Lord. The king then ordered Doeg, You turn and strike down the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men 
who wore the linen ephod. He also put to the sword no the town of the priests with its men and women, its children and infants, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep. But one son of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled to join David. He told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul. I am responsible for the death of your whole family. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. The man who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too. You will be safe with me. Amen. We're all used to contrasting things, aren't we? So probably the most common phrase when we think about something being contrasted to each other is we'll say, well, they're like chalk and cheese. Probably you've uttered those words, right? That's like chalk and cheese. Something like that. Or something similar. We're used to highlighting contrasts. If you were to go down a football in line, which you obviously you know I love football, so it's easy for me to come up with something like this. In football in terms, the contrast would be something like Wimbledon's tactics of the early 1990s, which if you watched football then, you'll know this were hoof the ball long, use brute strength, and kick everything above the grass. It was basically what happened if you played Wimbledon. You just got kicked off the park. And they would lump the ball down and they'd batter and bruise you. All right, and if you played against them, you'd feel like you'd go on to Mike Tyson. Compare that with the football of Barcelona, maybe 10 years ago for a period of time, where everything was finesse. It was little passes here and there. They called it the ticker tacker kind of style of play. They passed it, it was a joy to watch. I think they, nobody is going to get the ball off these guys. And it was beautiful. It was the definition beautiful game. You would think if you put them by side and watched them that they were playing two completely different sports because one looks brutal and bruising, the other one looks very graceful. In the passage we've got in front of us tonight, there's a huge contrast between Saul and David. Now, that's happened a number of times already. We've seen Saul going one way, David going another. It seems to be highlighted, maybe even more so here, I think on the starkest contrast between the two in chapter 22. So you get David, who is wonderfully Christ-like, and you've got Saul, who is devastatingly anti-Christ-like. Uh, we'll look and flesh those two things out in a minute. Um, last week, Oliver showed us the significance of Doeg the Edomite uh, being present in chapter 21, and then into 22, uh, and... He, he, he showed us through why, why it mattered that Doeg was even there when David went to see Ahimelech. And, it, and it, he plays this key part in chapter 22. As the tragic story unfolds, Doeg is, is, is integral to it all. So, uh, verses 1 to 5, then first of all, David is on the move. I'm not going to do much of this because Oliver covered some of it last week. But David is basically on the move. He's running, he's hiding, he's not staying anywhere for too long because Saul is after him and Saul wants him dead. But even though he is shifting around constantly, people are gathering to him. Somehow they know where he is. So whenever David is on the move, there's more people joining him. First of all, it's his family. They hear where he is, they go down to him, they join up with him and then a whole load of other people gather to him. And that is the first way that we'll see David as a Christ-like figure, but we'll come back to it at the end, because we're going we're gonna to kind of do Saul first, then we're going to do David uh, at the end. Another way that David is, is seen to be different to Saul is that David's got a prophet with him. God is bringing God's word to David. And so David's stock is still rising. He is looking more and more like the king, the king that Israel really need, uh, and Saul is, is, is going the opposite way which we see massively played out in verses 6 to 19, where the focus is on Saul. So news arrives at Saul's ears that David has been discovered. And, and this prompts 
uh, basically a paranoid outburst from Saul. He sat under a tree. Uh, it must be a particularly well-known tree in place because the detail is given to us and was, the readers would have known. Uh, the first readers would have known exactly where this was. He sat under the tamarisk tree in Gibeah. He's there with his, uh, with his cronies gathered all around him. Fortunately, the spear he's got with him this time is still in his hand. He's not hurling it at anybody. But that's where he is. And look what he says. Let's go through his words bit by bit. He says, listen to me, men of Benjamin. Notice, where's Saul from? He's from the tribe of Benjamin. And here, he has given jobs to the boys, basically. The people in his own clan, in his own tribe, they're the ones he's got around him. They're his advisors, they're his men, they're the ones gathered with him. Here is the guy who has basically kept, or tried to keep people around him, who he can trust. But he doesn't trust them, does he? Because look at the next thing. Will the son of Jesse give you all fields and vineyards? Will he make you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Saul doesn't even name David. There is no respect for him there. But he's, he's effectively flexing his muscles in front of these, these advisors. He's like, think about what I've done for you. I've got the power to give you these things, to dish stuff out. David's got none of that. Is he going to do for you what I've done for you? So why on earth, then he goes on to say, have you conspired against me? Not one of you tells me when my son is a cover of the son of Jesse. No one is concerned about me or tells me when my son has incited my servant to lie and wait for me as he does today. This is a massive, massive pity party from Saul, isn't it? Woe is me. Oh, isn't it terrible? He's, he's just feeling sorry for himself. But he's also incredibly paranoid. But notice, isn't it? This isn't even the reality of what's happening. So Saul is spinning it to be, David is lying in wait to ambush me. But the reality is David is on the run because Saul's desperate to kill him. David isn't lying in wait for Saul. And even if you look back at those verses, the crew that David has got with him is just a ragtag bunch of nobodies. 400 people in total. Saul has the entirety of Israel's army at his disposal. If they stood side by side to fight, there would only be one winner on paper, wouldn't there? Only one winner. Saul is turning into, very, very quickly, the stereotypical dictator. He is distrusting. Even the people who stood with him, he's paranoid. He's suspicious of everybody. He's scared he's going to lose his power. And this all stems from the fact that Saul rejected the Lord, and so the Lord left him. And the further that Saul runs away from the Lord, the further he keeps going down this line, the more he looks like the rulers of the nations around, rather than the ruler of Israel, as he was supposed to be. And so here he is, standing there, basically having a go at all the guys around him, paranoid that they're all on David's side. And in the midst of that, up pipes Doeg the Edomite. The first of three times we're told that he is Doeg the Edomite. The Edomites, therefore, well, or, or were the descendants of Jacob. Uh, sorry, no, the descendants of Jacob's brother, Esau. Sorry, they were the descendants of Esau. Doeg is not then one of the covenant family of Israel. Doeg is an outsider. So I would keep being reminded he's Doeg the Edomite, Doeg the Edomite, Doeg the Edomite. He's an outsider. He's not part of the people of Israel. He is not a friend. He is a foe. But here he is, in amongst all of Saul's officials, and he's brave enough to step out into the world. You can kind of picture him coming forward, can't you, with a flattering tone in his voice, wanting to suck up to Saul. Well, actually, Saul, I saw the son of Jesse come to Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, a knob. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath the Philistine. There is Doeg trying to weasel his way into Saul's good books. Here he is trying to look, ah, oh, yeah, you don't trust him, you can trust me. He's adding fuel to the fire of Saul's paranoia. And yet he too <laughs> is not speaking the whole truth, is he? Because that isn't exactly what happened. Because if he really wanted to tell them what happened, Elhimelech didn't know that David was on the run. Ahimelech thought that David was on a mission for Saul. Ahimelech, as far as he knows, David is one of Saul's best soldiers. He's one of Saul's most trusted men. That's what Ahimelech thought. And so he's like, right, better help David. He's on a mission for the king. 
But Doeg misses that information out. Doeg is, is trying to get into Saul's good books. He's a murderer. And yet, Saul in his paranoia listens. Because what Doeg is saying is backing up what Saul already thinks. Saul is ready and willing to listen to somebody outside of Israel so that he can try and catch up with and kill David. So because he's got somebody backing up his <laughs> illogical series of thoughts and how the events are panning out, he says, right, get Ahimelech and the rest of the priests and his family and bring them to me. Now if you're Ahimelech and a message comes, the king wants to see you, and you've got no, no suspicions that anything's up, you go, right? For all he knows, it's an invitation for an audience with the king, and he could be on for a promotion. Saul might be coming to say, Ahimelech, you're doing such a good job as a priest, I'll give you some extra land. You're doing such a good job as a priest, here's a bag of silver. It could have been anything like that. Ahimelech has no idea. He's walking into something that he doesn't know what's going to happen. What Saul then does, with Ahimelech. Again, he won't call Ahimelech by his own name. Again, lack of respect for Ahimelech. And then he dives right in with the accusation. Verse 13, why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse. You gave him bread and a sword. You've inquired of God for him. So that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does today. Now, if you're Ahimelech, you're thinking, what on earth is going on here? He must have been stunned. He's been broadsided. He's thinking, hold on a minute. Isn't David, like, the commander of your army? Isn't David one of your most trusted and loyal servants? Isn't he your son-in-law? Uh, yeah, I've inquired of the Lord for him plenty of times, not just this once. And I'd, I'd do it again. I don't see why any of this is problematic. So what, what are you getting at? But Saul isn't thinking straight, is he? He's not acting rationally. And so Ahimelech's words to him just rile him up even more. His irrational fear then leads him to demand that Ahimelech and his family are killed. Because in Saul's mind, they've committed treason. Saul has turned on David, the Lord's anointed, and now he's willing to turn on the Lord's own people. His own people. And when he has the opportunity to stop and change his mind because his guards won't do it, he then turns to Israel's enemy to do it. Doeg the Edomite comes forward and he kills Ahimelech and 85 tall. And then in a catastrophic and incredibly ironic moment, Doeg again, presumably following Saul's command, wipes out the entire town. Now, it's obvious why that's catastrophic, right? Because the loss of life is immense. The irony here was Saul himself was commanded to carry out the Lord's judgment against the Amalekites and to totally wipe out their city. But he wouldn't do it. For whatever reason, he wouldn't do it. Even though it was the Lord's command, it was the Lord's justice against the Amalekites, Saul wouldn't do it. But this time, without a second thought, Saul brutally gets rid of his own people, blinded by fear, and drunk on the power. And you see how Saul is becoming very anti-Christ like. He is opposed to the Lord's anointed one, David, and he is opposed to the Lord's people, his own people. Now Saul isn't the Antichrist, capital A, the figure who comes in the last day. Yes, there will be one of those, man of lawlessness, Second Thessalonians, etc. But the Bible makes it very clear, doesn't it, that Antichrist is to stand against the Lord, to stand against the Lord's anointed one. 1 John 2 verse 18 says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and have you heard that Antichrist is coming? Even now many Antichrists have come. There's something else worth noting here. This is an atrocious act. Doeg butchers people at Saul's command, and there is no way to overstate how horrendous it is. We should read it and think, man, this is, this is horrible, this is brutal. Because it, it is. But for those of us with really good memories, something else might well spring to mind. Flick back to 1 Samuel 2. 
1 Samuel 2, verses 30 to 33, we find this prophecy. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that members of your family, this is Eli's family, will minister before me forever. But now, the Lord declares, far be it from me, those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. See, the Lord had told Eli that his priestly line would end because of the behavior of his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They died on the same day. You can read about that in the very next couple of chapters, back in the early part of 1 Samuel. But now the line is wiped out, bar one, just as the Lord said. So we've got to be clear in this, in our heads, that there is a, there is a, a responsibility and a guilt here that absolutely falls on Saul and Doeg. They are responsible for what goes on here. They're responsible for the death of the priest. They're responsible for the atrocity in the town of Nob. But equally, if you look at 1 Samuel 2, who is sovereign over it all? The Lord. The Lord's word comes to pass. It always comes to pass. Sometimes it comes to pass through the deliberate evil actions of men and women. Now it happens here, but it happens even more clearly in the most incredible example in Jesus' death on the cross. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter preaches at Pentecost, he says this, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now, I know you've heard this from the pulpit before, but it's a truth that needs repeating. You see, in this story here, and ultimately in the cross of Jesus, and in a number of other places throughout Scripture, it is, it is abundantly clear that the Lord is sovereign over all things. And yet, we as human beings are totally responsible for our actions, for our sin. See, even in the greatest act of rebellion ever committed, the ultimate act of cosmic treason, the unjust murder of the perfect Son of God, it was planned and purposed by God in eternity past for good. The Lord works in and through all things to bring about his plans and purposes. Nothing takes him by surprise. God has a plan. He doesn't have a plan B. He's not sat in heaven flapping about trying to fix stuff when it's gone wrong. He has ordained history from beginning to end. And ultimately, he'll then wrap it all up and he'll get the glory. Now, we've said a lot there. We haven't really done any application on it yet. Here's some application in light of how we see Saul becoming more and more anti-Christ and how we see the sovereignty of God even in and through that. And like we've said, what we've said about Saul being anti-Christ, we can see and see it in the world around us now that as governments and others oppose the church and oppose the Lord, none of it is out of the blue to God. And that's a truth to cling on to, isn't it? That is a truth to cling on to, that as persecution comes to the church, whether it's through government enforcing laws that undermine the truth of God's word, or whether it is society calling good what God calls evil, or whether it is indeed those within the visible church approving of things that God does not approve of. There is a truth that in and through it all, God is sovereign. And that truth can be a, a comfort to persecuted believers 
around the world to brothers and sisters in Christ of ours when they face a real threat of arrest. It can bring hope to brothers and sisters in Christ who live under regimes that threaten them with death for naming Jesus as Lord. The truth can be encouraging to all Christians who suffer any or all kinds of loss for the sake of Jesus because we can know that we stand with generation after generation after generation after generation of faithful believers throughout history who have been through the same things but are now in glory. Even as Saul opposes God's anointed one and God's people, even as hundreds of antichrists throughout history have opposed the Lord and opposed the Lord's people, God is sovereignly working in and through those things to bring out his plans and purposes. There's Saul, the one who is becoming more and more antichrist like. But what about David? David tops and tails the story, beginning and end, we see David. And there's two things we need to say. One is, who is it that gathers to David? Look back at the beginning there. Who is it that gathers to David? Verse 2. Those in distress, those in debt, and those who are discontented. Man, that is a motley crew if ever there was one, right? Distressed, in debt, and discontented. It is a gathering of weakness. And it is a small gathering. There's only 400 of them, and there have been a lot more people in Israel. What a picture of the gospel there is in who gathers to David. Think about when Jesus calls the 12. Who does he call? The social elite? No. The educationally superior? No. The cream of the crop? No. Who does he call to himself in the 12? Fisherman, a terrorist, a tax collector, a traitor. I once read somebody who said, I would love to have been in the room the day that Simon the Zealot met Matthew the tax collector. Because man, that would have been fireworks. You'd expect it to be anyway. But at various points in the gospel account, we get the same thing. As crowds gather to Jesus, those crowds who come to him repeatedly are full of sinners and outcasts. Much to the annoyance of the Pharisees, the religious elite. Because it is the needy who flock to Jesus. And in the early church, it's the same too. Listen to how Paul uh, describes the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. You can see where this is going, right? How countercultural this is to the world. I mean, when it came to PE at school or playing football in the schoolyard, you'd get lined up, right, so teams could be picked. Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, this is bringing back bad memories. I I'm not doing that to bring back bad memories and make you go home sad. But who did the captains pick? The captains picked the best players and their mates, obviously. And invariably, the same people will be left at the end. Oh, well, we'll have to have so-and-so. In fact, you can have him. We don't want him. That sometimes has happened too, right? It was gutting to be left to last. Well, think about some of the programs on telly. Love Island, all about what? The external image. The prettiest and the fittest. They're the ones who get picked for it. Because obviously, who would watch a program in the same format about all the geeks and misfits? They wouldn't, would they? What the world values isn't what Jesus values. See, David didn't turn these guys away. He could have gone, I don't want you lot, thanks. <laughs> Can you go and find some better people? Some people who are a bit stronger, a bit wiser, a bit better. In fact, just go and find some more people because you lot, useless. But he doesn't. And neither does Jesus. As those sinners and outcasts come to Jesus, he welcomes them, he speaks to them. See, the church isn't made up of the best-looking, most intelligent, and well-connected people. 
Right? You may, hey, hold on a minute, what are you saying about me? It's not, though, is it? Don't be wrong, there will be some in there. But that's not how they get chosen. It's not how the church comes about. The reality is here, isn't it? Are you in distress? Burdened by the worries of life? Are you discontented, struggling to see your value in society? Or fed up with the world and what it's trying to sell? Are you feeling lost? Not sure of your place? Wondering where you fit? Do you know that you need something outside of yourself? Something more than this world has to offer? Do you realise you're a sinner? A rebel against a holy God? In that case, Jesus calls and welcomes you to himself. Jesus offers you forgiveness through his death on the cross. He offers you fullness of life because death could not hold him and he rose again from the grave. He offers you purpose because he calls you to follow him. And in him you will find contentment because he meets your deepest needs. Life won't be easy. He doesn't promise that. David didn't promise that to these guys. Life wouldn't be easy. They were on the run. But there was genuine hope for them now that they were gathered to David. And there is genuine hope for us as we are gathered to Jesus. There is a future in him that can never perish, spoil or fade for anyone who will come to him. So if you're not a Christian this evening, that's the challenge for you. Look around at what this world values and what it has to offer. And realize that it's hollow. But in Jesus there is real substance. There is life everlasting. There is everything you could need. What about also the end of the chapter? What does David promise Abiathar? This is Abiathar whose entire family have just been butchered by Doeg the Edomite. The whole lot, but he's escaped. He comes to David and what does David give him? He gives him refuge. He gives him safety, he gives him protection. And again, here is a picture of the gospel because as we come to Jesus, the Lord's truly anointed one, the promised one, whom all of the Old Testament scriptures point towards, this is what we get with him. Refuge and safety and protection. David's words to Abiathar, particularly at the end, could be Jesus' words to us. You will be safe with me. We're safe in Jesus, right? Hidden in Christ. No one and nothing can snatch us from his hand. Nothing, the Bible says, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. As good as it was for Abiathar, who had nothing, to be welcomed by David, to be protected by David, it is better for us it is better for us because Jesus' life was sought, wasn't it? His enemies wanted him dead. But he willingly laid down his life once for all so that we could be free. So that we could be saved. Jesus died and then rose again to live forever. So that in him, as those who belong to him, that would be true for us too. From the end of this story, we have to say, be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged, because in our doubts, in our struggles, when we fall into sin again, when the world is crumbling around us, when we've got nothing left, those words, hear them. We are safe with Jesus. Nothing in you, nothing outside of you, nothing you could do or fail to do, can change that if you're in Christ. Nothing. You are safe in Jesus. As Saul becomes more anti-Christ-like, David becomes more Christ-like, and yet we are still left longing for the perfect Christ. Because David even realizes his own actions are partly problematic in this, aren't they? He realizes, oh, I should have realized Doeg would go and do this. Man, I feel partly responsible for the fact that I'll be after that your family is gone. And we know David's not perfect. He made a mess up in the last chapter. He's going to mess up again later on. 
But he is the Lord's anointed one. And here we have a picture of him, how he points towards the anointed one who is to come. The one who we know has come, the Lord Jesus Christ. One final contrast between the two. Look at the, look at the last words we get on each of their lips of Saul and David. Saul's final words are basically, you will surely die. David's final words are, you will be safe with me. See, without Jesus, there is only death and hell. But with Jesus, there is life and heaven. And so we need to celebrate Jesus. We need Jesus. We celebrate him because of his perfect life, his sacrificial death, and his glorious resurrection. We celebrate that as we read his word, but we celebrate it now in visible form, in a commitment to him as we take communion together. We remember and we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again.